Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, colleagues. Thank you for joining us today for this conversation with Hugo Slim about his new book, Solferino 21, Warfare, Civilians, and Humanitarians in the 21st Century. My name is Stuart Campo, and I'm the team lead for data responsibility here at the OCHA Center for Humanitarian Data in The Hague. And we're really thrilled to be able to host Hugo today virtually, as is the case still in most events these days, to dive into his book, have him share some of the great insights from his research that led to the book over the past two years, and particularly look at some of the implications of Hugo's analysis for issues relating to the use of data and technology in humanitarian action. You should see the chat and Q&A functions in the probably bottom right corner of your browser or WebEx app. So please do feel free to share any questions for Hugo during the course of the conversation there. And we will try to get to as many of them as possible by the end of the discussion. To dive in, I'll just quickly introduce Hugo and then invite him to share a bit of a summary of the key insights from his book, and then we'll take it from there. So Hugo, welcome and thank you once again for joining us for this conversation today. It's really a pleasure to be hosting you. For those of you who are not familiar with Hugo, Hugo is currently at the Oxford Institute for Ethics, Law and Armed Conflict and has been leading their research funded by the Red Cross over the past two years into the 21st century battlefield and humanitarian response. Hugo's career has combined academia, frontline humanitarian operations, and policymaking. And prior to returning to Oxford, he was the head of policy and humanitarian diplomacy at the ICRC from 2015 to 2020, giving him great insight into the 21st century battlefield as it relates to both the experience of civilians in conflict and the way that we as humanitarians strive to respond. Hugo, to get us started, I'd love for you to summarize some of the key themes from your book, particularly as they relate to the trends that are shaping warfare, civilian experience, and humanitarian response today. Over to you. Stuart, thank you very much. And it's such a pleasure to be doing a UN event. And um, thank you for inviting me. I'll do my best to summarize this book, the Sulfur in the 21 book, um, in a few minutes, um, just so that you've got a handle on, on what it says. So. Just to start, the rationale of the book was the 160th anniversary of the original Red Cross book, which was Henri Dunant's A Memory of Solferino, which he eventually published in 1862, which was really the text that called for the setting up of the Red Cross and um, the first Geneva Convention. So the book marks that anniversary and tries to do a little today of what, of what Dunant did then, to look at the battlefield as it is today, the state of war, to look at humanitarian response as it is today. So looking really 160 years after Dunant's original um, vision of humanitarian aid. And the book's organized, I hope quite simply, in three parts. It has um, a section on warfare, a section on civilians, and a section on humanitarians. So you can dip in, you can either read none or one or two or all three. And it focuses really at the outset, I mentioned three themes that struck me from reading Dunant's 19th century text. And the first is that the tipping point we are at in warfare, which is a similar tipping point to Dunant's time in 1860s, where the world of war was moving from a conventional sort of warfare of horses and cannon and rifles and, and swords into the industrial era of industrial warfare and massive bombs and armies and planes and trains and um, eventually nuclear bombs. So I sense where it is a similar tipping point in the nature of warfare at the moment as we shift in a way from industrial warfare of the 20th century into the computerized warfare of the 21st century. And the other thing that struck me from going back to the original was that, you know, Dunant says nothing about civilians. His focus is on the wounded male body of the soldier. And of course, that's very different today because at the center of the moral and humanitarian frame we put around war today is the civilian. And more than just the civilian is the woman and girl civilian. And then the third thing that struck me reading Dunant is his emphasis on national humanitarian networks, which chimed, of course, strongly with the localization 
policy discussion we have today in the humanitarian world. So I focused really on those three things. But just to give you a glimpse of the warfare section, um, the first chapter is about warfare so far this century. It's the first 21 years of this century, and it makes a few points. It has 10 characteristics of war. It notes that most wars, in fact, all warfare really so far this century has been militarily small with relatively small forces competing against each other, not massive armies fighting over continents and um, the skies and the seas and the oceans. A lot of warfare is urban, fought by coalitions. It's very long, very often, et cetera, et cetera. Things that you know, because you, many of you work in these wars or on them. The second part of the warfare section is about next generation warfare. So then I look sort of at what's happening today and look 10 years out. And what's striking is that none of the major powers are really preparing for the wars being fought today and in the first 20 years. They are all preparing for something I call big war. So this is massive scale war again with a lot of AI based technology and adding three new domains to warfare, not just land, sea and air, but outer space, cyberspace and information space. And this is the warfare they are focused on and it's potentially a return to great power conflict, peer-to-peer -peer warfare between massive armies. And that's what I focus on in that section um, of big war. And then I look at the particular AI-based, if you like, warbot dimension of big war and how, in a way, we're moving from a long tradition of human-machine interaction in warfare and in industrial warfare now to a sort of fused human computer interaction that is the dominant um, texture of 21st century warfare now in the big powers and the warfare they're preparing for. And I look at AI ethics and the challenge of the speed of, of autonomous machines, um, their learning as they go, questions of judgment, responsibility, authenticity in warfare. And the second part of the book is about civilians, and here I look at civilian experience and I make the point, which may feel terrible to some of you, that in a way, civilian battle deaths in the 21st century so far are relatively low, I mean, very low compared to civilian violent deaths in the 20th century. And of course, that's good news at one level, and we need to keep it that way. Um, but these wars so far are not massive wars of massive civilian deaths. In a way, they're more distinguished by indirect deaths from the destruction of essential services and, of course, from displacement. So I look at what I call the death displacement ratio, where very often you might get a low violent death rate, but it produces a massive displacement rate. So, for example, in Yemen, in, in rough figures, I can work out that for every one civilian violently killed in war, 333 are displaced. And so the predominant experience, as you all know, of civilians in war today is not violent death, but displacement and socioeconomic disaster, impoverishment, and um, those kind of indirect, terrible dimensions of warfare. And then I look a bit at gender, and I, I note the extraordinary achievement that we've made to put women and girls at the center of warfare and to understand the different experiences of women and girls and men and boys. Um, but I do also point out that I think that the pendulum has almost swung too far towards women and girls to the extent that while we understand everything about them or a lot about them now in warfare as civilians, actually the male civilian is becoming the invisible, forgotten civilian in warfare today. And then I have a chapter on civilians as survivors and make the point that you're all aware of as well, that actually most civilians save themselves, most civilians protect themselves. Um, if they can, most civilians are responsible for their own survival. And that humanitarian aid does good things, but it can only ever help some of the people some of the time in a few ways. And then the last chapter is on humanitarians. So it's on presumably you, a lot of people uh, watching today. And the first chapter there really focuses on humanitarian progress. And I, 
I do feel that we can show extraordinary progress in the 160 years from the Battle of Solferino onwards and show great achievements in many ways. And, and the whole system has saved so many millions of lives. And I look at this by comparing civilian experience in Syria in 1916 with civilian experience of, of Syria in 2016. Similar kind of warfare and a massively different outcome for Syri Syrian civilians, most of whom, many of whom have survived, albeit in difficult circumstances, because of a humanitarian system. I then look at the characteristics of the first 20 years of this decade, of, of this century, and I distinguish it as a period of humanitarian elaboration, saying that aid has become much more elaborate, complicated, ambitious, even utopian in, in many ways, um, widening the needs we feel we have to cover as humanitarians, moving into digital space, a long time physical space, moving our time horizon to say that we're about the long game, not just the short game, and really almost in a position where we want to engage in the globalization of welfare and create safety nets across the world for millions and millions of people, a sort of global welfare. And then the last chapter is about changing humanitarians, and that's where I'm quite critical of the current system and I note that really what we call the international system is not hugely international and global, it's a western club, it's run really by an expatriate elite from the west who dominate it sort of like a monopoly or oligopoly and so that's where I come out very strongly in favour of what the, the sector calls localization and argue for humanitarian self-determination, that people inside their own societies should be able to shape and form and build their own humanitarian institutions and define what humanitarian citizenship means for them as citizens of their country. And it's the duty of the Western system to support that growth. So that's really what the book's about. And we can hopefully discuss it a bit. Brilliant, Hugo. Thank you so much for that uh, whistle stop tour. The different themes that you've covered, I think, will emerge naturally in the different aspects of the book that we'd like to cover here. And the piece on humanitarian elaboration is where I'd like to start. This really struck our team, both in terms of how it relates to needs assessment and understanding the different needs of people affected by crisis, but also to your point, how this has really driven quite an expansion of the humanitarian system uh, in recent years. So there's one quote that I'd like to, to quickly share from the book to get us started, because it's one that certainly stuck with me uh, <laughs> in reading it. So I'll just read this out and then hand back over to you to elaborate a bit farther. So humanitarians today are trying to address every wartime human need and building large, intricate bureaucracies to do so. Aid work is becoming quite Baroque. Its policies and practices embellished with hundreds of ornate social, economic, and environmental objectives that aim to address every area of human life and human rights. So Hugo, unpack that a bit for us in terms of how it relates to us understanding as humanitarians the needs that we can and should respond to and also this piece on how that's really elaborated the way we see ourselves and our role uh, in delivering assistance in the 21st century well i i think really we have as a, as a profession decided that we need to do everything and that we need to respond to every um form of suffering and every need for protection um, that we encounter in war. And, and that's what I call humanitarian elaboration, because I think it is the main characteristic of what's happened in the last 20 years. And at first, I mean, firstly, it starts from a, a really determined elaboration of our fundamental principle, which is the principle of humanity. And I note in the book how, in a sense, humanity, which may have started 100 years ago, was a, a very big label to cover everyone, saying we are all human, we have this single meta-identity, humanity, and it must be protected and respected. Um, that has been in the tradition of Western liberalism and social theory in the last 20 years, really drilled down into to create a diverse humanity. So now what the last 20 years have done and more really is look at, you know, 
but there's different ways of being human. So there's different ways as a, as a girl, as a boy, um, if you're from some ethnic group or another, you know, if based on your race and all these differences and your class. And humanitarians have set themselves this extraordinary ambition in line with their sort of cousins in social welfare and development to really understand the nuance of every single person and try and meet them where they are as this principle of diverse humanity rather than simple humanity in a way. And that makes programming very complicated. There's another aspect of these micro identities, Hugo, that you point out, which increasingly is relevant in the 21st century battlefield, which is the digital aspect. You speak extensively about the digital bodies and this concept of both the sort of analog and digital worlds in which civilians experience conflict and which we increasingly as humanitarians need to respond. Could you elaborate a bit on this point again as it relates to sort of our understanding of what needs and, and sort of what programs are best situated to be central in humanitarian assistance as we have populations in crisis increasingly connected or as you importantly point out in some circumstances beyond the digital reach of humanitarian organizations? Well, I, you know, it's a wonderful thing that we can be talking like this now and we can be joined by a huge, you know, crowd of people, part of this event and listening to us. And that's because we, you know, we can exist these days in, in several different places at once, in our digital body, in, in virtual space, in our virtual lives. And I think, you know, all civilians now, are, well, not all at all, because many are offline, but a lot of civilians um, have virtual lives as well as physical lives. And that means there's a humanitarian agenda in their virtual lives and a need for protection and assistance in that virtual space as there is in physical space. And so that makes our challenge complicated, but very exciting too, because we've had to go into digital space and you guys are, you know, your team and Opsha are the, are the gurus on that. And it means that we have, in a sense, two bodies, if you like. I mean, a hundred years ago, most people could only be in one place at a time and manifest in one body. Um, they could write a letter to someone miles away and the person could receive that letter and then they would have a bit of that person in their hands for a bit. But today we can be in several different places. We can be in lots of different um, data centers. We can be visible on lots of different channels. We exist in many places. That means we can help be helped and we can be hurt in many different places simultaneously as well, which makes it so challenging. This reminds me, Hugo, of another quote that actually really stuck out at, at me while reading through the book. So I'm going to show on the screen again to kind of uh, keep us focused on, on grounding in your analysis here. And then I'd love for you to elaborate a bit farther on this point, particularly around the risks and uh, opportunities around digital and how we approach that from a policy perspective. So building on the point you were just making, you observe in the book that aid agencies can expect an exponential increase in the volume of data that they generate, hold, share, and use. They can also expect to rely on more and more artificial intelligence applications to help them collect, sift, and interpret humanitarian data and then deliver aid. This is already creating big challenges of data security and data protection for agencies and for individual civilians whose data and digital lives they hold and share. This, of course, resonates very closely with the work that, that me and my team are focused on day to day, but I think importantly underscores the fact that this growth is still very much underway. We have exponentially more data now than we did even last year and, and certainly five or 10 years ago, but we see the increasing digitization of humanitarian assistance continuing to gain speed and scale. So as you look at the 21st century battlefield and think about some of these changes, you, you also observe that we're constantly playing catch up, right? And this is something that we feel in our day-to-day -day lives, trying to draft policies and guidance. So could you elaborate a bit on, on that feature of, of humanitarian response today in terms of the tools and systems evolving faster than the instruments that govern their use and how we might think about uh, applying some of our core principles effectively in a digital age? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a, a, a great question too and a key point. And I'm you know, I started in 1983. So when I started, uh, we were still going around making lists of people and things with barrows and paper and then a sheet of carbon paper to get a copy underneath the original one as you wrote. And then you would have 
two copies of your data, sometimes three if you pressed hard enough and had another one. So, I mean, that's where we're sort of coming from. That's where I started and typewriters and that sort of thing. So the challenge is hugely different now. But, you know, humanitarians have always put people's data on lists somewhere, on paper, in boxes, and had, you know, great areas of data. They've collected people's virtual bodies, if you like, before before computers. But I think it is difficult now because, because as in every area of technology, we, we tend to um, invent something before we understand fully all the things that could happen to it or from it in the lived world, as it were. And, you know, this idea that you can invent technology and do no harm um, is just not not realistic. And I always, I take in the book, I take the example of the motor car, you know, which sort of arrived on the scene as a fantastic thing because it was so much faster than the horse. And, you know, you could get into it and you could fill it with this amazing liquid and off you would go and you can put three or four people in it and off you went. Um, but of course, we couldn't understand immediately until we saw it in the world and we understood what happened, that A, it would kill a lot of people by crashing into them, by running into them. Um, it would also combine very badly with alcohol so that we would have a lot of deaths that way and it would start polluting the world enormously. So this is the challenge you, you all have whenever you have a new technology. You're not going to be able to um, understand it from the get-go. And I imagine that's what a lot of your team are constantly working with, that catch-up you talk about. Um, and I think we need to give ourselves a bit of space there and say, well, that's normal. And that's how humans always adapt to technology, because we can never see it in its 360 degree implications from the moment we invent it. Um, and that is our, that's the ancient myth of fire and creativity and human technology. I really love that section of the book, Hugo, and you've summarized it really well in terms of pointing out that there's no way to anticipate all the, the potential risks or benefits of technology uh, as it arrives in society or in this case in humanitarian context. And so we are constantly playing a game of catch up, but also deliberation. We'll come to tactics for deliberation on ethical issues a bit later in this discussion, but what I'd like to do is bring you to the, the discussion of war bots and try to draw an analog to some other uses of technology in the sector that are perhaps uh, closer to home for humanitarians. So as you mentioned earlier in the summary of the book, there are really three issues around war bot ethics and sort of the consideration of increased human machine teaming and increased automation uh, of weapon systems, but also other technologies in humanitarian settings. Those are judgment, responsibility, and the loss of human authenticity. Could you elaborate a bit on those different considerations first, just to give people a bit better understanding of sort of what we're talking about with those three key issues? And then we'll we'll get into how this might relate to automated decision making for humanitarians rather than war bots. Yeah. So if we stick with war bots, which is war robots, for people who don't know the phrase, but I, I imagine most of you do. Um, in a sense, the challenge there is, is we are dealing with, you know, algorithms of violence, as people call it. So, you know, you design um, systems by which these, and programs by which machines can be violent under certain circumstances and whatever. And I mean, the first challenge with all this is the extraordinary, in my view, going forwards on this, the extraordinary speed that machines can operate compared to us, compared to how we think and, and in real time. And when you have, hundreds of them, as we're going to, thousands of them, then you've got intense speed and extraordinary proliferation, um, which makes it very challenging for the human to keep abreast of everything. So there's that point. And that means, therefore, um, how can you rely on machine judgment? And that means how can you um, program machines to make the sort of ethical humanitarian law-based judgments in a battle, who it shoots, who it um, surveys all the time, um, who it attacks, who it defends, when, et cetera, et cetera. And then difficult choices it might have to make between, you know, if it's shot down, crashing on a school or crashing on a supermarket and, and how it makes those judgments. And I think that's the sort of thing we're gonna have to think hard about. And my view in the book is that we probably need to think about that as a whole society. We can't just leave it, I think, to 
military lawyers and politicians and the ministries of defense and soldiers, um, because they will, by nature, have their own vested interests. There'll be certain kind of people um, who view problems in a certain way. And I think the big opportunity we have with war bots at the moment and ethics is that the whole of society is going through this too. So we're going through it with you know, automatic cars, automatic trains, um, all technology. So we've got to make sure that warbot technology is folded into all those wider discussions we have as human societies coming to terms with this new technology. The other point is not just about the judgments they make, you know, who programs the, the ethical algorithms into them and who agrees them and how are they made. The other thing is about responsibility, because I also believe, and this is in contrast, I think, to some people in the humanitarian world, I believe that we will lose human control of these machines. And I think we're actually not dealing with machines that are weapons that we control, like a sword we pick up and we use with our mind and our brain and our control, and then we put it down. I think we are going to get machines that are actually non-human combatants. And there's a a lot of interesting literature about the fact that we've got to get ready for a world where we recognize that machines can be autonomous moral agents. In other words, that they're going to be making decisions and ethical choices in the way that we do. And that means that we won't, in a funny way, have sole responsibility sometimes. And we're going to have to get used to more hybrid ideas of responsibility where, you know, we have to decide that, that the humans and the machines all had different responsibilities. And then the last point about authenticity is really, you know, what a lot of people say is, you know, can you, is, is it really true to call it war anymore if humans aren't really fighting, hurting, and part of it in a very real way? Um, so are we delegating machines to do all sorts of things that we should properly take moral responsibility for because they're so terrible? And is it going to make it easier um, if machines are doing it, and we'll lose contact with, in a sense, the most dangerous part of ourselves, our violence. This was a, a very sobering observation in the book for me, Hugh, and I imagine for many readers to think about the fact that our sense of losing human control does not necessarily mean we're heading toward dystopia, because you point out rightfully that in many cases in warfare of the past, human control has been deliberately nefarious and quite violent, not just accidentally so. So reckoning with that and recognizing that as we program machines to sort of automate different processes, not only of war, but also humanitarian response, we can't assume that modeling them on our behavior will lead them to do good. And I, I think that that really raises a lot of questions around how do we think about what is right and, and moral in these contexts, but also how do we think about the inputs to these systems and the ethical frameworks to think through the dilemmas that would be faced by humans, our machines, and the teams increasingly that we're seeing between the two. And this raises another point that you cover around different frames for humanitarianism and different frames for humanitarian ethics. You observe, and I'll, I'll share the quote uh, on the screen because I think it's an important point for colleagues to see. Apologies here. Should now hopefully see this, yes. So for new generation humanitarians, a need to accept a variety of humanitarian systems and that they should also expect a variety of ethical approaches to humanitarian aid. Experience tells us that being humanitarian is universal, but not uniform. And I realize there are a number of key points in this passage, Hugo, but I'd love for you to unpack a bit sort of what you are getting at here in terms of the fact that we can't assume one set of values or one set of principles in your other book, which I also have here, of course, Humanitarian Ethics, you observe the proliferation of principles in the system over the past uh, several decades. So. What are we looking at in terms of a system or systems of humanitarian ethics? And how can we start to think in 21st century warfare and humanitarian response about how to navigate some of these dilemmas effectively? Yeah, thank you. I, I mean, I'm thinking really in that in that quote, I've been thinking about humanitarian aid rather than IHL and things. And what I'm saying there really is if, you know, if I was to characterize the last 20, 30 years of what we call the international humanitarian system, which is, in my view, the sort of Western system, um, I think we'd probably call it liberal humanitarianism. 
And it, it sort of coincides with a lot of Western readings of human rights and, and, and liberalism. So what I'm saying is that, you know, that that's not the core part of humanitarianism. The principle of humanity can be interpreted by other traditions who perhaps don't share all the human rights interpretations um, of of the Western liberal system about, you know, the need for a totally free society and an accountable government and transparent government and, um, you know, LGBTQI rights and, and things like this, which, you know, other cultures are not going to take on quite so quickly, some maybe not at all for the next few years. But I think we still have to recognize that those cultures do have a sense of the universal principle of humanity and impartiality. And we must expect other forms of humanitarianism to emerge, which ne don't necessarily look like ours, but they have a family resemblance to ours, but don't share all our liberal commitments. And this is inevitable because, as I also say in the book, you know, the Western system is never going to be the global system. We have to accept that, you know, a lot of people listening to us are never going to work in Russia. They're never going to work in China. Um, the system that we've financed, which we call the system, the Western club system, um, really has its own sphere of influence where it can go and large parts of the world where it can't go. So we need to accept and recognize and, and welcome different manifestations of humanitarianism when we see it, even if it doesn't look um, like the full liberal deal that we like. That's what I'm trying to say in that bit, I think. Yeah. I think that's a good way to summarize it, the full liberal deal. And we will get a little bit later to that very elaborated system of humanitarianism and your call for simplicity uh, for, for next generation humanitarians. I wanna take a question from the chat now as it relates to the, the conversation we're having and then we'll move a bit farther. But we have a question here from a colleague who works on anticipatory action. So for colleagues that are perhaps not familiar with this type of assistance or, or analysis and assistance in the sector, this involves using data and data science to anticipate shocks and hopefully trigger the release of financing to mitigate the impact of those shocks and therefore reduce humanitarian need overall. And the question is, essentially related to the principle of humanity as it's originally framed as you were describing earlier hugo and whether if our capacity to foresee suffering improves should we address suffering not only when we see it but also when we foresee it yes um i'm really excited about anticipatory aid and of course you know i you know, when I started out in the 80s, we were all desperately trying to do it. We called it early warning around famine and, and things like that. So, you know, we've always been trying to foresee um, crisis before it creates extreme suffering. And yes, I think it's very important that we we preempt um, and that we do that. I, I think, you know, foresight is going to be a difficult field in itself, not just technically, but actually. and um, there are lots of people working on this much more than I will you know, understand it. But foresight can also um, depend on your positionality, as they, as, as you know, the new generation say. So, you know, if I foresee something as a white male, old, gray haired, you know, hetero guy, I'm going to see it and foresee it in my own image in some way. So we're going to have social conundrums around foresight as well. Um, which are determined by positionality and another person who's very different to me would foresee a much you know a different thing so yes we need to get preemptive aid right and yes it's right to stop something if you can before it happens if it's bad but at the same time um we've got to be clear about the fact that our foresight is is fully authentic for the people involved and we're not just foreseeing it as we would imagine it happening to us if you like, if that makes sense. It does make sense. And it's an important point to, to connect that positionality 
both in terms of how we see and analyze needs that are already manifest and those that we might foresee uh, through methods, including those used in anticipatory action. This is a piece that I wanted to connect to the discussion around warbot ethics, actually, and automation, increased automation in the sector, because in a way we're looking at handing over decision making and automating certain decisions, not just on the side of uh, combatants, but also on the side of responders in terms of how we understand and respond to need when we might trigger the release of funding and increasingly teaming or handing over decisions entirely to machines, though that's really not happening much now, despite some of the articles suggesting as such, it certainly will become more uh, central to how we analyze need and, and respond as humanitarians. So are the issues from an ethical perspective the same, Hugo, in terms of responsibility, authenticity, and, and speed, and sort of the concerns you were already laying out? Or are there any other ethical issues we need to keep in mind when we start thinking as humanitarians about automating some of our processes and automating some of these important decisions about who receives assistance, the forms of that assistance, and how we prioritize uh, the delivery of aid? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I mean, it's your, it's your job. And, and, and your team and everybody and probably a lot of people listening. I, I think um, there's two things really about automating humanitarian aid, if you like. Um, and one, I think, is that we have to remember that there will always be gaps and misfits. I mean, I'm very struck how often a machine recommends something to me, thinking, oh, I've got Hugo right. This is exactly what he likes. And I'm going, no, I don't. What, how on earth did you get that? And they must have heard me say a word or something like that, which was sort of offbeat and it's zoomed in on it. So, you know, we have to recognize that AI, just like humans, has its own weird positionality somewhere that comes from somewhere. So it's going to leave people out, people fall through the cracks, and it's going to misallocate sometimes. So I'm sure you're all onto that. I think there's a bigger challenge is possibly between AI and EI. And, and, you know, the humanitarian profession uh, finds itself deeply committed to the notion that it is not just a commodity based um, profession. It's actually an emotionally based profession, too. So, you know, if you listen to the discussion about Ukraine at the moment, it's a lot about um, and and we shared a cup of tea and listened to each other and talked to each other. So it's that whole emotional intelligence dynamic. Now, I think that's going to be a real challenge for how you make sure that you don't just say, oh, AI is doing it, so it's done. And how somehow you um, complement AI with EI and that they, they they do exist somehow together. I'm not sure. I don't think we're particularly close to, to EI based machines yet. Um, but then, you know, we still haven't perfected EI based humans either. <laughs> so, you know, that's a struggle we all have through our lives. So I think that's that's one other area where I can imagine it's it's going to be not as simple as it sounds. And we, we, we need some kind of emotionally intelligent anticipation and, and yeah, response. Yeah, I, I was uh, ready to intervene and say I think emotionally intelligent humans would be a good start, Hugo. So I'm yeah. glad to share that. A slight skepticism, but also, as you say, you know, it's an opportunity to program some of this thinking in and, and refine our own frameworks for how we navigate these issues as humans uh, prior to expecting machines to do it similarly or better. I wanted to touch on, again, in the vein of sort of how we see populations in crisis, but also how we help them be seen a part of your book partially from the section on civilians, but also on the section on uh, humanitarian data or the use of data. And I'll just share a quote here about sort of what we see and what we miss, and then would love for you to uh, to elaborate a bit farther for us. And again, sorry, just going to quickly get this going. So you observe that the, excuse me, the data that we have also focus mainly on populations who are seen. By humanitarians. Their gaze is often skewed towards particular groups that they can reach and in whom they're especially interested, like women, children, and displaced people. These preferences leave out many others. Humanitarian data also focus almost entirely on needs and do not track and study how well people are surviving without aid. I think this is a really strong part of the book, Hugo, because you force us to 
remember, as you pointed out in your summary at the beginning of this conversation, that we only are able to respond to some of the needs of some of the people in crisis some of the time. So could you elaborate a bit on this point of sort of who is seen and captured and reflected in data and therefore our plans and our response versus which groups might be left out and also how we might be able to address that or sort of think how to approach this differently to make sure that we're both capturing needs more comprehensively, but also appreciating the, the capacity and resilience of populations in crisis? Well, I, I think, you know, and you use the word appreciative, and of course, the, the, the form of appreciative inquiry um, is, I've always really liked it, you know, you go around and say, you know, who's all right? What's working well? Who, where's success here? And we don't do that very much as humanitarians, of course, because our whole our whole paradigm is about things that are wrong, needs that are deep and wide, people that are suffering, et cetera, et cetera. And I do think we need to correct that when we make a needs assessment. I think we should be much more um, simultaneously doing an appreciative inquiry, saying that there are great community groups rising here who are um, organizing stuff, they're, they're making progress, they just need a little support, we don't need to do much. Um, there are other people who are fine, et cetera. And I think we don't quite give the balanced picture enough um, and we're still overly focused on, well, if I'm if I'm honest, finding victims and probably making them a bit too. So um, I think that is a challenge. And I, I would love to see more appreciative inquiry. I think people do sort of do it, but then they probably cast it aside. Um, but I think we we should be doing both, and um, then I think we'll we'll have a better balanced view of how people are living, how people are surviving exactly where they need help and where they don't um, and a bit more realistic view of our role because at the moment we present we still present ourselves as the saviors most of the time thanks for that hugo and appreciative inquiry is not something i've thought about since i left development for humanitarian work well, there you are. that's a good point because that's a, that's where it was done before yeah exactly and and it typically has been done in the context of sort of communication activities and being able to understand knowledge attitudes and practices which frankly now as a, accountability to affected people becomes more central as a priority for humanitarians could be a good place to start and uh, i think you know we do have a number of questions in the chat and I want to make sure we get to them, but just to kind of close the loop on 21st century humanitarians understanding and appreciating the, the people that they're working to serve, but also being able to navigate some of the ethical dilemmas that you've mentioned. One point that, frankly, since your book on humanitarian ethics through to Solferino 21 really jumps out at me as someone who, with my colleagues, tries to understand and deliberate on ethical dilemmas related to data is how, how much of a gap there is in our capacity as a sector to do this. We're great at enumerating principles. We're great at elaborating guidance. But the deliberative capacity is something that you've observed uh, fairly is lacking. So what might be some tactics for humanitarians on the ground, not at the headquarters level, preferably because context is king. What might be some tactics for us to sharpen our deliberative instruments when we start to understand these are some of the key ethical issues that we face using data and technology and humanitarian action and meaningful dilemmas really need to be grappled with. There's no right or wrong answer, right? Mm -hmm. But how might we do that more effectively uh, as humanitarian practitioners? So, I you know, I think we do all deliberate. I think a lot of time is spent, you know, if we if we replace the word deliberate with worrying, you know, you probably find a lot of people are worrying, but they call it sort of operational decisions or operational choices, or they wouldn't they wouldn't necessarily use deliberation and ethical language. But I think a lot of people are worrying about if they're doing the right thing, what should what should they do? And that is deliberation. And my feeling is that if you can treat it more consciously and be more conscious of it as a rather important um organizational activity uh, and then when you know you're in deliberation mode um, it's it's helpful and it puts you in a different space and I think you know there's some simple rules that are almost the rules of good decision making anyway um, first of all you always try and deliberate with others and it comes back to that you know positionality point you know you there are a lot of the questions you're dealing with you you really need to find the answers from other people who are directly concerned for them by them as you know, civilians who are hungry or 
sick or whatever or displaced or frightened you know they need to be in that process where they're saying what's what they think would be best in the situation so you need to deliberate with others um i think the other thing is you need to deliberate on on genuine problems um you know you really have to be quite firm with yourself and say look well we know what the option is there and we've we've either implicitly made a choice or we're going to make a choice I, you know i've been looking at myanmar a bit lately and and you know, agencies there are i think they sort of think they're deliberating about what's morally right you know should they work more closely with the military dictatorship um should they you know what should they do where do the principles fit <clears throat> i actually think they're not deliberating anymore they're dithering you know they're actually just endlessly hesitating because they don't they're not courageous enough to make the choice <clears throat> i think they know what the choices are but they're not prepared to make them um because they'll all lose their jobs or they'll have to go and do dangerous things or um whatever so sometimes people are apparently endlessly deliberating i think they're just end end endlessly postponing <coughs> and avoiding so it's really important that you are deliberating on a genuine problem and you're doing it seriously um i think the other thing about deliberation is somehow we need to retain the capacity for discretion because it's very important that sometimes people on the spot are able to use their discretion in a in a moral judgment that they can make and be responsible for it and respected for making that choice and i haven't been close enough to operations for many years to see if that if the level of discretion is still there but i would have a sense that because communications makes it so easy to talk up the chain and to so many people and widen the discussion that actually instead of people using their personal moral discretion in a certain situation they probably freeze and keep referring it up the line because because they can when i started we didn't have any comms so you couldn't ring someone and say what do you think about this can you have a discussion you know you you couldn't so you tended to have to make discretionary decisions um and i think we mustn't lose that it's really important and, and you know if you look at military ethics as well it's very respected that in the hot moments discretion will be required you know you won't have time to deliberate endlessly so i think things like that if that's if that's helpful I think it's very helpful, Hugo, and I think the call to identify when we're dithering rather than deliberating is also an important uh, jolt to the crowd. One one piece that comes to mind here, of course, is that the there's often a conflation between dilemmas and tough decisions, right? And and you spoke to that just now in in your response to this question. I think it relates to a number of the questions in the chat, and we're going to try to get through as many of them as we can in somewhat of a logical order here. So the, the discussion around the use of AI and EI, hopefully amongst both humans and machines, has triggered a number of reflections from the audience. People are asking, for example, um, what opportunities this might bring in terms of shifts in our own consciousness as we start to evaluate kind of to the point you were just making about sort of pushing moral decisions up the chain. Will the use of machines, um, AI and, and hopefully machine EI, help create space for more of this type of deliberation? Or might it shift our sense of responsibility as humanitarians in terms of what issues we're responding to and how we're making decisions about that? And this is very much paraphrasing a question in the chat, but any, any thoughts on that sort of shift potentially in our consciousness <laughs> and what opportunities this might bring? I knew this would be a difficult webinar because I'm I'm really sort of off piste with all with a lot of these tech stuff. <clears throat> I think these sort of AI and you know will they make things simpler and easier or or harder? I think it's probably circumstantial. So I mean I can imagine that AI uh, simplifies, <coughs> sorry, and brings lots of extraordinary detail. To a situation and I, i'm thinking of military targeting where you know the eye in the sky kind of thing now can see in great detail what is happening around a target now that's introduced sort of fine-tuned ethical granular decision making into shooting and firing that wasn't really necessarily there before ai and so in certain ways it can really magnify and zoom in and make us pay very detailed attention in other situations, I imagine the temptation goes the other way. And when you're looking at scale, you're probably constantly 
having the temptation of saying, well, couldn't we get more data? Can't we get more data? Can we just, you know, give us more, give us more, give us more scale so we understand the whole problem? And then you're sort of tempted to hope that somehow the answer is out there, if only <clears throat> you could get more information and data. <clears throat> and I think that's the challenge of big data, that we always think we can get more and it'll improve it if we can, but actually at a certain point, you just have to know you'll never have enough. Absolutely. And you point to this tension in the book, Hugo, <coughs> is Sorry. The, the lack of available data is a challenge, but also too much data can also be a challenge. And there's this data fog, as you put it, uh, increasingly in the sector, because more data doesn't mean better data necessarily. And as we have these mega trends that you've pointed to in the book, complicating the way in which crises occur, and civilians experience them, we're also increasingly working with new and different data sources that are bigger in a lot of cases. One area where this is particularly manifest is around climate change and the impacts of climate and sort of the complexity of climate shocks uh, with particularly conflict, but also other types of crises that humanitarians respond to. And there's a question in the chat about this interplay between climate and conflict, and maybe to get you back on piece, although you're doing very well off piece, Hugo, you always say you're not as comfortable on tech and data, but you're, you're one of the experts. But on the impacts of climate and conflict, you do observe this as a, a mega trend uh, to, to watch out for, and we're already seeing it manifest. So mm -hmm. what are the key issues there in terms of that interplay uh, and what can humanitarians expect in terms of the, the changing climate and how it affects the way that conflict is unfolding? Yeah. I mean, I, I just as a general point, I, I was saying this morning to Asma, my wife, that I think, you know, the sort of buzz word of, of the current times is going to be multi because everything's multi, multi-crisis, multi-polar. You know, there are so many different things happening at times, at the same time, and of course, conflict and climate change is one of those multi-dimensions where the two are interacting concurrently. And of course, now we have food prices and everything else. My, my view is that um, climate and conflict will, it, there's sort of two dimensions to it. First of all, you know, I point out in the book that war, is incredibly damaging to climate and to environment. And, you know, Brown University did this incredible study of the environmental cost of US wars in the 21st century so far. Um, and, you know, the billions of tons of CO2 emitted by going to war and that sort of thing. So first of all, there's that interaction there that, you know, the way we fight wars is really bad for climate. And, and that actually is making me think, I didn't put it in the book, but I thought about it since, that in a way, one of the challenges for humanitarians, and it's a, it's a weird one, is to really lobby for green weapons. And to say, we need to really focus on weapons development that, and this is an appallingly sort of bizarre thing, kills people and destroys the old building, but does not produce masses of CO2 and destroy the environment. And, you know, that's almost an unthinkable humanitarian road to go on but i think we will have to start arguing for green weapons so that's one thing the other thing is that in terms of conflict the, the conditions in which war is going to be fought war's always been fought in extreme climate conditions snow desert jungle whatever um that's going to get much worse probably you know armies are going to have to move where their bases are because they're all a lot of them by the sea and they're going to be flooded they're often going to be getting too hot their kit won't work etc so the conditions of warfare are going to come very extreme and armies and forces are going to have to adapt with new kit, clothes, whatever, whatever. But in terms of the relationship, the causal relationship between conflict and climate and climate and conflict, you know, the latest IPCC report, you know, from a couple of months ago or whatever, um, makes it clear that it, it, it feels it's not a big link at the moment, that actually climate you know, is a multiplier of conflict, but it's not driving conflict. Now, I'm more pessimistic because I think that's going to change and I think it's going to change around adaptation. So I think we're going to see conflicts over adaptation because one state's positive adaptation could come at the expense of the deprivation of another state um, or community. You know, my guaranteeing water security could mean the deprivation of water security to my neighbour. 
And so my adaptation is maladaptation for them. And I think my sense, but you know, I've got no evidence for this. Um, my, my theory of human nature would suggest that we are going to be having wars over adaptation as we all try to adapt with self-interest. If we fail to cooperate through the COP and through everything else to really agree principles of just adaptation, if we fail to do that, I think we'll be fighting over adaptation. So just adaptation and, and just war coming together there in terms of theory. Absolutely, yeah, exactly, yeah. There, there are a number of questions in the chat. We'll take one more and then we'll, we'll come back to your kind of final call to action in the book, Hugo, and, and give you a chance to speak to what a simpler form of aid might look like. But I do want to recognize another dimension of conflict as it's evolved and as you've called it out, which is increasing urban warfare mm -hmm. and, and how this sort of challenges and demands changes in the regulation of war. This is a question uh, from the chat. So given the current uh, conflict in Ukraine, do you expect any changes to the regulation or understanding of urban warfare based on, on this current situation and sort of how might you see that evolving? So, um, you know, I'm no longer at the ICRC, so I speak as me now. And I think, yeah, I think there will be probably some new the declaration on urban warfare that, you know, um, you know, restrictions on explosive weapons in urban areas and things, I think that declaration might go ahead and we'll have new norms emerging. I think in terms of behavior though, um, I'm afraid cities will always be fought over. You know, one of the things that the IPCC reports makes clear is that adaptation is gonna be urbanization for a lot of people. So the centers of population will become more urban as we adapt to climate change. So therefore, in a sense, fights may become more urban as well. And, you know, I. I really think it's going to be hard to avoid explosive weapons in urban areas if some people are determined to fight and stay in those urban areas and other people are determined to get them out. And so, yes, there will probably be new laws. Will they always be respected? Um, will they always be seen as militarily feasible? I'm, I'm not so sure. Um, and if you have a, um, you know, if, an army like the Russian army, which has a particular tradition of war, which involves massive bombardment, artillery, um, and a, and a, you know, a relatively indiscriminate and reckless approach to war and suffering. Um, I'm not sure there's going to be that much that new regulations will, will be able to do because I don't think they're going to go into hard law yet. And, um, we know there's always a challenge with enforcement. So I, yeah, I'm a bit more pessimistic there than I would have been at the ICRC. Well, we appreciate your candor, Hugo. And I think it also applies to some of the areas you mentioned in the, in the beginning, which you summarize well in the book in terms of new spaces of warfare, uh, outer space, cyberspace, and information space. Regulation is similarly opaque at this point in terms of how IHL applies in these domains. And the connection between the cyber and the kinetic is increasingly clear, but how we regulate and, and ensure um, legal and ethical uh, combat and response is still unclear. So we really, we really need to uh, continue working on this as a community, and we will continue to draw on your expertise to do so. Hugo, I'm going to share the final quote from the book and then ask you to give us a sort of call to action for a simpler form of aid, because it's really, you know, something that resonates, I think, with with the entire uh, audience and the humanitarian community here. So you say that the new generation of humanitarians now has a choice. They can continue to become the masters of their own complicated bureaucracies who are trying to understand every angle of human identity and experience in war and respond to every kind of suffering, or they can work to a simpler ambition. What would that simpler ambition look like, Hugo? And I'm not brilliant at this because, you know, I'm a sort of, you know, what needs to be non done, not how it needs to be done. But I, what I would urge people to do is I think we, you know, we have become, you know, a victim of our own success or a victim of our neoliberal period of success when Western governments have been prepared to back humanitarian agencies. And we've created these huge bureaucracies. We've created, you know, we've had the luxury to make aid very complicated, best in all sorts of social analysis and whatever. My, my argument would be is, you know, a lot of that is good, but um, 
whenever you can in any decision you have, I think you should be trying to prioritize simplicity. Simplicity of the way you're doing it in your organization. So you're not creating more and more expensive organizations with new jobs and new teams, but as simple as possible. And as simple for the people you're trying to help so they don't have to respond to endlessly complicated survey questions, um, have to sort of configure themselves to um, your institution. So I would just be thinking of simplicity when, whenever you can and put it as a principle. Um, really of, of practice, because I think over the last 20 years, it's been the other way, you know, how can we make this more nuanced, more granular, more complicated, more, more, um, you know, holistic. And I just, you know, my instinct is look for simplicity whenever you can get it. Um, but I was saying this to another crowd the other day and some, you know, much younger people than me um, said, yeah, but the world is complicated, Hugo. So we have to have complicated organizations and maybe that's right. And maybe, you know, a certain, you know, the younger generation today is more at ease with a complicated world and complicated tech and complicated everything. So this is just an old geezer saying, no, simplicity is quite good. You must try it. But um, I still think you should prize it as a virtue in the interest of the people you're trying to help so you don't complicate their lives and in the interest of keeping your costs down, frankly. Hugo, I think let's not seed complex responds well to complexity. Your call to simplicity is right. And I think we can all take that to heart as we pursue the delivery of better and uh, more responsible assistance in increasingly complex humanitarian settings. The book is Solferino 21. Strongly encourage you to go out and get a copy if you enjoyed it. And we'll also share a link in the recap with the film from this conversation to the microsite, which Hugo and his team have put together for those of you who are a little bit too busy to read a book right now, but still want to draw more on these themes in the days and weeks ahead. Hugo, thank you so much for making the time for this conversation. It's been an absolute pleasure, and we look forward to continuing to learn from and with you about the ways in which warfare, civilians and humanitarians will continue to evolve in the 21st century. Thank you so much. And thanks to everybody for joining us. Have a great day. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, everyone.